Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm on a, a PhD studies in political science, and particularly I'm investigating this concept of overton window of the role of, of a state in society that my presentation is going to be. Also, I'm uh, uh, working as a program director of uh, Libertania. It's, uh, liber- it's classical liberal think tank that I'm one of the founders here in Macedonia. And I'm also related to this uh, international organization or international movement, which is called Students for Liberty, which is a libertarian uh, student organization or movement, as I mentioned. Okay, I think that I can uh, share my presentation with you. Yes, do you see it? Okay. Okay, yes. So as you can see, then the name of the presentation is Liberty Change and Overton Window of Political Possibilities. It's somehow related uh, to my, to the dissertation that I'm working on, which should be like, uh, as I mentioned, Overton window of the role of the state in society. So basically I divided this presentation and this expose in three parts. The first part is going to be about the ideas of liberty, about ideological tendency that are, that are relating to individual liberty. Then I'm going to talk, uh, later I'm going to talk a, a little bit about uh, the concept of social change and finally i will end with the uh, overtone window of polit- political possibility as a potential in- instrument for uh, measuring the capacities for social change okay can you hear me well like can you see the presentation is everything fine okay so firstly what would be Okay, <laughs> what would be individual liberty? I understand that uh, individual liberty uh, as a space for practicing uh, freedom, for exercising human action, which is bound with other similar or uh, exactly the same spaces. They, it's deriving from the principle of self ownership, which is deriving from the right of property, to Locke's right of property, where, where each person have. Firstly, proper, the right of property of uh, his body, uh, his action, and uh, the, the, the fruit of his liberty. Here, the guarantee serves as, the, 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 as a guarantee serves the principle of non-aggression, which states that every aggression in, in the social relation is unjust and unjustifiable. And when it comes to the politics, the results of the politics of idea of individual liberty would be kind of uh, minimal or how the liberals are calling it a night watchman state with a strictly strictly limited role that is relating to protecting citizens and according to according to uh, other uh, according to other philosophies following this libertarian or liberal traditions that there is no need of the states at all because all of the services, all the services the state is providing can be provided on the market also. And then when it comes to economics, we are talking about free market economics based on guaranteed uh, rights of private property. And here comes the question like why liberty, why liberty to be essential and to be Central. Basically, they, you, they, they can be provided uh, to basic arguments for or to basic justifications for individual liberty. The first is the moral or philosophical or the, the subject, su- subjective justification of uh, individual liberty that is deriving directly from this principle of self ownership or the, 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 the right of property of person's body and fruits of his labor. And here the liberty is achieved as the final goal and, and as, as a goal of itself, like no matter of the consequences. People should be, should be uh, liberated, people should be free, no matter what would be the consequences of their actions and their freedoms. And the second or the social or the utilitarian or the economic justification of the individual liberty, uh, it's uh, de- deriving, it's based on the utilitarian principle and is, uh, is perceiving liberty as a goal, but also as a method for achieving other 
social goals and as a way for uh, uh, as a way to better the lives of more people within a society uh, the, the, the the idea of individual liberty presupposes a lot of uh, ideo ideological tendencies it can be found in the writings of Lao Tzu before uh, which is existing before Christ and in his uh, anti-authoritarian uh, thought, then you can find it, you can find uh, the ideas in the dark ages in the Salamanca, Salamanca school of economics where promoting their, when they're uh, educating and promoting these uh, principles of uh, free market, uh, free market society. And uh, it's then it, it got its zenith in with the phase of enlightenment. In Europe, in the classical liberal thought of uh, John Locke, Adam Smith, David Hume, and then uh, it is developed like a little bit leftist tradition of I'm uh, I'm also considering this part of uh, tradition to this within this uh, broader ideological tenden tendencies of liberty. It's about uh, mutualism for of uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Proudhon. Then we have this uh, individu individualist anarchism of uh, America, which are inspired a lot of by uh, Proudhon and someone called this, someone's called this uh, anarchism as analytic, analytic anarchism or the, the only anarchism that is possible, uh, contradicting the, the leftist or the collectivistic anarchism. Then uh, in the beginning of, or at the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of 20th century, we got the, the Austrian economic school of Karl Menger, of uh, Ludwig von Mises, of uh, Friedrich Hayek, especially about uh, when we are talking about Austrian school, I'm especially respecting uh, this guy, Ludwig von Mises, which, which can be, according to me, which can, like, not only to me, to other libertarians, can be, uh, can be regarded as the Nikola Tesla of social sciences. Later, we have after the, the, the Second World War, we have uh, these uh, radical uh, libertarian tendencies of Murray Rothbard that are totally anarchists and they're rejecting the, the state is in any, any form as a manifestation of, of a force. Then we have objectiv objectivism of Ayn Rand that we were talking about. Then we have these uh, scientific tendencies of public uh, choice theory of James Buchanan. We have the monetary theory of the Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman. We have uh, his son David Friedman, which is talking about radical capitalism, in, in, which is in its sense it's uh, anarchistic. Also, I'm putting here the social liberalism, the, 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 the German uh, example of order liberalism. I'm here I'm putting also the, the bleeding heart libertarianism, which, which are uh, perceiving not only the, indivi the individual liberty, but also the, the social justice and the, and the imperative of some kind of uh, social welfare of the, of the people. At in the end, uh, I'm a a uh, great proponent of this big tent approach of the idea of individual liberty, which can cover all of these schools, all of these tendencies, all of this, uh, all of, all of this, uh, how to say, uh, which, which comes with, uh, with this organization uh, students for liberty, so that, that there, there is place for each interpretation of indi individual liberty under, under this big tent of approach of libertarianism. Uh, here comes the second part, it's about the social change. And uh, I was thinking about if you have a question to ask me now, or maybe we, we can discuss it after the presentation. I, I think it will be quick, like I, I won't take so much time. Can you hear me? Okay. So what is social change? The, 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 broad, the, the broadest description, uh, it, it would be like, it would be the sum of social pro processes which results in change of institutions within a society. Broadly speaking, they could be distinguished two types of social change. The first is like the, the violent 
social change. Uh, the, the history is an example of violent social changes, changes taking place. And the second is the peaceful social change, where the social change is, uh, is framed within the institution of a society. And it starts as a revolution, but on an individual level, not on collectivistic level. So uh, when it comes to social change and uh, freedom and liberty, uh, the social change towards freedom, towards freedom can be uh, described as a sum of social processes, which results in a political institutions, which value the principle, principle of self-ownership, establish a free market economies, guarantees the peace and rule of law within a society. And as libertarian can be regarded the people that are skeptical towards political authorities and uh, their attempt to satisfy human needs and solve social problems through a top-down centralized and political or violent method and thus promote market-based solutions of human needs and social problems. So what would be the, per the, 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 the perfect method or the right method for libertarian or uh, social change toward freedom? It would be like uh, Murray Rothbard is a great uh, theoretical theoretical theoretician of uh, this uh, this social change or this activism for uh, freer social change and he he places two basic pillars for libertarian or social change toward people the first is education like educating the masses and the second is mobilization or creating this libertarian community Basically, th this process would go through developing of, of centers for educating, promoting, and uh, nurturing this uh, libertarian or classical liberal thought. And th this libertarian action is directed uh, toward change of public opinion, not directly towards the political elites. And uh, through, through this methodology, through, uh, through direction to the, to the social change of public opinion, that will potentially result in pressing the political elites to change the institutions or how, how they're calling uh, like uh, this activism for social for libertarian social change can be set as uh, shifting the overtone window in an upper direction that i'm going to present next and finally comes the third part and like the probably the the, the empirical part of my uh, PhD thesis, it's about Overton window of political possibility, possibilities. Yes, uh, what is the Overton window of political possibilities? It is basically a conceptual model for understanding how ideas in society change over time and how they influence politics and uh, political decision making. It, it, it was created by Joseph uh, P. Overton which served as a vice, pre vice president of a McKinnock Center for Public Policy, which is a free market think tank in the USA. Basically, it goes like this, that are, uh, it stated that the politicians are limited uh, in what policy ideas they can support. And they generally are, uh, they, they general, generally are pursuing uh, policies that are widely accepted within a society as a legitimate policy options. And these policies lie inside the Overton window, while the other policies that are existing uh, lays outside the, this Overton window. And uh, if uh, politicians somehow actualize these these ideas into politics, are risking their position and they're risking their popularity, and they, of course they're uh, risking their uh, they, 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 their authority and they. Their, their place in power. And uh, how does it look, the, the, the Overton window of political possibility? Here on the right side are, is, the, the, is the common sense of the people toward, toward, uh, toward an idea. And on the left side, it's not, uh, you cannot see it here, but uh, here lies the ideas or the policies which are gradated from uh, less freedom towards more, more freedom. And as a classic example the, for describing the Overton window of polit political possibilities, people or libertarians are 
using uh, concrete uh, public policy that are related to cannabis, to cannabis legalization, or as I'm calling them, uh, green public policy. Just imagine on the on the left side here on the overturn window, you can start with uh, a policy uh, that are less free or that that are not free at all. For instance, it can be stated, it can be claimed that uh, uh, all people that are cons consuming uh, drugs should be punished by that, and it can gra gradate. While at at the top of the of the graphic would be uh, the, 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 the politics that are uh, more freest or no politics at all, according to anarchists, where the, all of the drugs should be legal for co consumption and for selling and for exchange. And the Overton windows is, is pointing to the, to the ideas that are somehow popular or maybe a little bit sensible and the poli that the politician can adapt into concrete or real politics. And my idea about uh, the, the dissertation and about the thesis to develop an overturn window of the role of the state in society. I want to see how the people are aspecting the, the state and according to, to their opinion, what would be the perfect role of a, of a state of a state in society. So basically the, the methodological framework of the concept of overturn window of the role of the state in a society uh, it can be exposed through developing uh, a survey with statements relating the role of a state in a society and potentially the attitude, the attitudes of the respondents to the state's role. Uh, here th there would be like a statements, for instance, uh, and of course the respondents will uh, value these statements from one to, to five, depending on how much they agree of these statements. For instance, one example of a statement is, I would, uh, I would rather die for my state. And like the respondents, we will value the, this statement from one to five. Also, another statement could be, uh, there should not be private education in our country. Also, this statement can be valued from one to five. And in the end, to see which uh, ideas are most popular and to develop this overtone window of the role of the state of the society. And in the end, uh, to see the, the validity of this concept of overtone window because it, it hasn't been uh, empiricized, if I can say so till now, I mean, till now I haven't still done that yet, but I'm trying to do, to see if this is really valid to see what is the role of the state in society through developing a great analyze of, uh, of a state in a society and to see where is the overtone window or how the people are perceiving the role of the state in a society. Also, because I, as I mentioned, I'm a, an activist with this, within this group, Students for Liberty and with this think tank, think tank that that I'm par part of, that I'm, I'm trying also to be part of this uh, uh, education and mobilization method for, uh, for promoting individual liberty. I see the activistic dimension of this concept. It can somehow help these libertarian centers and these libertarians to see the areas of, pot of potential for shifting the overturn window and especially the, are, the areas for pressing the, the, the political elites. And also it will help uh, providing a method for measuring the concept of social change and uh, also the, the capacity for social change. Yep, that's it, thank you. I hope that you will have question or uh, some remarks or suggestions or whatever. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, so I don't know if I understood it correctly. So you want to 
uh, conceptualize the overtone window within your PhD? Do you also want to um, analyze it empirically? Or do you just want to provide others, other researchers? Actually, I don't want to conceptualize. I want to, if I can say so, em empiricize. Because I, I want to provide it like a empirical methodology for its developing. It's like one way, I think that it can be developed through a lot of various ways. One way is like through surveys or uh, through, uh, through question, not questioning, but through seeing, perceiving the public on opinion on a concrete issue. And the, the issue in my case would be the role of the state in society. Are you going to take like a random sample of the population and ask them this questionnaire? I, I, I would prefer, yeah, that there would be a section uh, about like uh, education. There will be a section about, uh, about age. There will be probably a section about, uh, about years. And potentially I'm going to look about intellectuals, if I can say so, like intellectuals, the people that have a higher, high, higher education. And it's, it's relating to another theory, uh, not like theory to another concept of Friedrich Hayek. He wrote this famous essay, Intellectuals and Socialism. And he said, he said in that essay that uh, the intellectuals are, are at, at, uh, at most, they're, they're shaping this public opinion. And I'm particularly interested in uh, uh, intellectual's opinion about the role of, of a state in society. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna add, age is gonna be a pretty important variable. I was literally just about to pick up on that because how older people would view the role of the state would be very different from, you know, young people, you know, we see a lot of activists out now, uh, especially you're saying around climate change, which is my expert, just he's saying that they want less role of the state because they believe that, you know, the kind of capitalist models are working. But um, you're conducting the study where again? In no, your country? No, in Macedonia. In Macedonia, Macedonia. In Macedonia yeah. yeah, because I was thinking, you know, uh, recent history's experience of this state is also going to be a I say massive variable. So what might apply to the overton window in Macedonia would be very different, say, to countries who've had a, yeah, a more distant, maybe I wouldn't say bad relationship with the state, but you know, modern history does come in, especially around that region. Yeah. So how would you factor that in? Uh, also, here it can place a great role, uh, like the the the. the, the, the the communist past of the of the people here in Macedonia and the, the fact that we gain our independence within mm -hmm. the frame of communist Yugoslavia. So somehow in our case, like communism and uh, nationalism are somehow not, not com maybe not communism, but socialism and nationalism are like allies. So mm -hmm. I think that that's why I guess that's why like the, 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 the people in Macedonia uh, would uh, like like the greater role of a state in society. Um, all right. Um, I was wondering, you had that uh, one page where um, you were enlisting all the uh, different liberal uh, theoret theoretical influences. Yeah. Uh, I was sort of missing Rawls there. Which one? Like Rawls, Theory of Justice. I, I mean, know, yeah. like he's like the, um, you know, the liberal thinker of the 21st, uh, yes, yes, the yes. 20th century. And, I'm more uh, from yeah. Olsen, but yeah, Rolls, it's like, I, I forgot, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, no, no, that, that yeah. uh, clears it right up for me. Yeah. Um, and then I was wondering about how are you going to mediate? Because like you said, it's a very big tent. And like, how are you going to mediate between like ANCAPs and objectivists like Ayn Rand on the one hand, and then people like Thoreau on the other hand, who, I mean, of his individualism, I believe he had a very different view than someone like Rand might, might have had. I don't think it's like about uh, mediation here. It's 
more about like providing a space for their uh, interpretation of liberty. So you're you're both take, you're taking the both sides of of the, the both branches or the both sects of this libertarianism. And like if I'm talking about myself, I'm really passionate about passionate about these handcaps and about Rothbard and about David Freeman and all of these things. But at the same time, I'm realistic and I'm living in a in Macedonia, which is so far a collectivistic society. And I'm not rejecting this big tent uh, approach of libertarianism. So on the other side, yes, I am ANCAP, but on the on the other side, on the other uh, side, I'm, I'm seeing uh, the, the social injustice that are present here. So I think there is a place for this various interpretation, at least in the science, there should be space. If I answer your question, <laughs> in a way, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, are you making that distinction between, you know, libertarianism is a very distinct form of liberal thinking? Like, how are you going to define freedom? Because a lot of liberal thinkers, like, say, Rawls, would think freedom would be, you know, ability to kind of pursue your best interests without restrictions, but that does require state to a certain extent, interference, you know, the whole idea of the veil of ignorance, you were supposed to build a society around, but how do we build that without, you know, having actual facilitation, uh, which is usually done through society. And then particularly, um, you mentioned Rothbard a lot, who I've never seen him mentioned in most, most concepts. So I was very excited about that, where he's very much like no interference, you know, if you somehow society is just going to regulate itself and provide charity without these sort of, so how are you going to define freedom? Because there's a difference between freedom from kind of barriers that might stop That's you like from entering and then freedom is like in a very concrete sense as a freedom from, from any state interference. Yeah, it's freedom from coercion. It's like this yeah. basic definition of freedom from coercion. A coercion would be defined as a, it's using violence and threat with violence to achieve a goal. I guess this would be like the, the, the starting point of, of uh, defining freedom and liber liberty. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I can share, I, I think that I have, I was like several years ago, I, I was writing uh, a paper about, uh, it was called uh, uh, the freedom as a fruit of individual liberty. So I'm defining the, the, the liberty as this space, this empty space, so in this uh, ne neutral sense or neutral dimension, while, while the freedom I'm, I'm uh, expecting like uh, more active, activistic or making choice and making actions. I, I think that I have it, uh, I, I will send it in the, in the conversation if you're more interested in it. Yeah, because I was thinking when you look at like Rothbard and then you have the more like Mills and Locke, they're so far away from each other, you know, they can't even really, they're on the same spectrum, but totally opposite ends. So, so I was wondering about creating a coherent theory with two such different approaches to liberty. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not trying to, to, to uh... I'm not trying to develop a coherent uh, theory. I'm, I, that's why I called it uh, ideological tendencies. And under this big tent approach of, of libertarianism and all of these justifications and interpretations of liberty, I'm putting all of these tendencies. It's, like, like, it's not like a coherent. I, I, it, it, to, to some, uh, to certain degree, I can agree with uh, Locke, I can agree with uh, Rand, I can agree even with uh, Proudhon, with some social liberals, but I, I'm uh, recognizing this core that they have. It, I think it's like individual liberty and freedom and this principle of self-ownership, I guess. Um, yeah. I Earlier, I forgot to say thanks again for your presentation. Um, it was really interesting, and I wrote down a bunch of questions. So I think I'll pipe up a, a couple of times more. Um, for now, I was wondering because you said um, that the uh, definition of social change that you, you're applying is, um, as I understood it, really much focused on um, 
social movements resulting in actual institutional change. Yeah. And that strikes me as a somewhat narrow view of social change. I mean, like, it, yeah. it ends up kind of being political change because, you know, for instance, Facebook isn't yeah, a yeah. state into institution, but I think most people would agree that Facebook has and other social media have resulted in very big social change. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this narrow uh, interpretation of, of social change because like social change is a, it's a great phenomenon and like can be written, it, it can be interpreted like through, through a lot of prisons. But I'm particularly taking this, this social change that will result in political or institutional change and like the, the change in the public opinion that will result, result in change in institutions within a society. Like this part. Yeah, that reminds me a lot. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him, of Jared Casey. He does a lot of work on uh, libertarianism and uh, he wrote a lot of books on uh, Rothbard as well. But he, Jared Casey. Can you write it? No, I, yeah. I, I haven't heard. Um, so um, I'll, I'll write it in the chat in a minute. But yeah, he, uh, so he was an old professor of mine. That's how I know about this. I did a course on libertarian anarchism, but it reminds me a lot of when he talked about how law comes about, how law is actually an uh, anarchy, like we think of it as this really structured thing, but it's actually quite, comes from anarchy. It comes from more the law reflects is just a codification of what society rules. So I think, yeah, your definition of social change definitely kind of relates to a lot of what I'm talking about, where like public opinion moves the needle Whereas a lot of time we think about things like politics, law and institutions as being set, but really they are the manifestations of society. And it'd be interesting to see if your window shows that the institutions have fallen out of step with society. Yes, yes. yes. That'd be an interesting area of inquiry, like, you know, comparing yes. what your studies to what the actual empirical situation is at the moment. Yes. Please write it. So I can, uh, so I can rule him. I can find something. Then. Thank you. Yeah. Your case, haven't heard. Great. I've got a um, maybe more pointed question, especially at the beginning of the presentation when I wasn't as uh, cognizant of the fact that, like, in how far um, the whole effort is um, focused on Macedonia, um, because outside of Macedonia, or at the very least, like in Europe, in, in Britain, in, in the US, um, at the very least there, but maybe also like in a global, um, global context, I would have really asked why, um, yeah, how the idea of a, a libertarian theoretical approach to societal change came about. And like how it, uh, how you end up, um, being an NCAP activist, because like I said, like outside um, the concrete context of Macedonia, like the Mont Pelerin society is a thing. And they have been very active in, in doing exactly what, what you're considering as change, you know, influencing public opinion towards the neoliberal uh, perspective and ending up with sweeping policy changes towards, the, towards that uh, ideology. Um, so yeah, then I, uh, I'd really want to know like, um, how even because unfortunately I'm pretty ignorant on the situation in Macedonia. And I'd also like to know, um, how far beyond the scope, uh, goes for, for you beyond, uh, Macedonia. Okay. Yeah, can you concretize a little bit the question? Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, like, how universal is your um, libertarian or this libertarian view of yours? Like, is it a thing that is about really, you know, um, far too strong and corrupt, maybe corrupt uh, state institutions in, in Macedonia or some other countries? Yeah, or is yeah, it, um, you know, like, like a general critique of the welfare state, for instance? It's, it's first, I think it's coming, it's Firstly, it's universal. It's a, like a general critic of, 
as you mentioned, the welfare state and this tendency of et etatism, firstly. And uh, secondly, of course, as a critique of the, the, the system in Macedonia and like the, 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 the politics that are, that are having impact on me. So yeah, I think it's, it's kind of universal, but I, I like to put myself in a position that wants to di dictate like uh, what's good and what changes sh should be done. But I, in, in myself, I believe that it's kind of universal. Like, like that people, if are more free, they, they will be like more happy and they will be more productive and they will enjoy greater welfare, like as a kind of general rule. All right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a yeah, go ahead. So uh, I've been reading about Polanyi, uh, his argument against uh, liberalism in economic sense. He argues uh, liberalism and Marxism are both uh, passive ideology. So that how, they can- yeah, Sorry, how I do? How do you say what kind of ideologies are? Uh, he's arguing both Marxism and liberalism are passive ideology, passive. as they are uh, <coughs> letting things like great regression happen without doing things, while social democratic uh, policies and even fascism are more active as they are trying to change things. So. Uh, What's the response to that? <laughs> I can I can agree to a certain point. Like fascism, it's uh, it's all about action. Like as Mussolini was saying, and I I don't know. I have I don't have like much to put on it. And it's yeah. I can make a point that it's uh, a libertarianism is like kind of reformistic uh, ideology tendency. So I, I believe in gradual incrementalistic changes. So in that way, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's a passive. It's like that we are going out on the streets and we are uh, abolishing the state and we are leaving the, the free society. But it, it needs time. It, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, it needs change of the public of, of opinion. It needs change of the opinion of the majority of the people within society. So in, in that way, it's yeah, it definitely, definitely, it's passive. But I, I don't see that as a, I, I don't see that in a negative context. Yeah. So that's what I was kind of thinking in terms of are, are you going like full push the button libertarianism where no there's no state institution or are you looking at like very much the minimalization of the state to protection of life, liberty, property. Like the fundamentals, yeah, yeah, not yeah, the I, completely I, arcanistic side. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm thinking about the DD second. I like more the second opinion because I, I don't believe in change like overnight. I believe in incrementalistic change, and the the, the very idea of liberty is this in, incremental steps, like little steps that in the long run that will uh, result in like more free society. Mm. Not like without pushing the button, because I think that yeah. that's, that's pushing about a button and bringing immediate change. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, it's not on a long run. Yeah. It cannot work on a long run. Yeah, and um, if anyone's not familiar, Murray Rothbard made a uh, an argument that people dispute, where he said that if he could push a button for making a society libertarian anarchism, he would push it regardless of the consequences. So mm. it's it's really contested his. Yes, it's yes, probably yes. one of the most contested parts of his theory. Yeah, yeah. and part mm. of his radicalness. Yeah, but he's very interesting to read again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like it's we really talking really earlier. Hard. Yeah, I, I like him a lot. Maybe I'm like not that I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> not that I'm, uh, how, how to say, it? that I'm not concerned that I. Uh, doesn't matter, okay. <laughs> I know what you're trying to say, yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask or like to maybe sort of pitch um, Hornet's um, concept of uh, social freedom to you as well. 
you know, towards the question of um, how minimal a state can be, you know, obviously, Rod, we already talked about that, might, you know, give some, okay, yeah. some suggestions to what that fact. And then Honnets, um, concept of social, uh, social freedom, I think would may also be like a helpful um, source to, to at least regard it some way. Like for instance, in the um, in the example of, of um, liber liberty libertarian or liber liberal policies um, towards drugs, uh, towards yeah. drug usage and, and trade, um, you know I think more and more people are getting on board with uh, with marijuana, but you know for instance heroin, and I've had had it uh, I've heard it said that you know people would also um, you know move for a liberalization of policies on cocaine and heroin and meth and so forth. So in those cases, um, just to illustrate the idea of social, uh, social freedom, if I'm even doing it justice, would be, you know, um, calculating on the one hand, the uh, pros for, you know, a free, con free consumption of, for instance, heroin. On the other hand, the social unfreedom that results in, uh, from, you know, lots of people being addicted to heroin. And that is likely, you know, just it's just some random scenario, obviously, but things like that, individual freedoms on the one hand can result in social unfreedom on the other hand, can, yeah. depending yeah. On, on like the I would policy not area. That, uh, social unfreedom. I would not say it's though, it's like uh, consequences of their action, like how brutal it sounds, uh, how brutal it sounds. But on the other side, like we can look at the good examples of countries that have decriminalized even uh, even hard drugs like heroin, cocaine. We have uh, the, the the experience of Portugal. We have the experience of Spain. Like people, the the one that wants to to, to use drugs and that wants to like uh, to take heroin, I think that they will take uh, even if there is like a strong prohibition as it as it is now. And even if it's free, so the, the, the very basic idea of free uh, freedom of uh, or legalized heroin, it's not that you can go out in the streets and you, you can buy heroin. I guess it will be like uh, in a special pharmacies or whatever and so on and so on. I think that they, they have this uh, practice in Canada when you can go to a clinic and you can like, you can take heroin in these laboratory uh, conditions. Okay. All right. I mean, regarding drug policy, that's uh, pretty enlightening. But, you know, the general concept that individual freedoms can lead to conditions where socially, in general, there's less freedom. Like, you know, Vanessa just, uh, just wrote this in the, in the chat. Um, we have, in a lot of countries globally, great individual freedom to tra travel, sorry. That timing. Um, and now we have this pandemic, which in some part, you know, I'm this is way too simplistic, uh, really, but in some part is also correlated to that individual freedom to travel. So there's an interrelation between individual freedoms on the one hand and resulting lacks of freedom, like the lack of being able to go out without a mask and everything, just going about our days as we used to without a risk of being infected by COVID. And that's what, um, you know, that's what uh, the concept of social freedom is uh, concerned with, you know, that um, calculation. So yeah. I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to send you, uh, send you an article or something later about Hannah yeah, yeah, yeah. theory. Yeah. Totally, I got, the, I got your point. If, for instance, like if you're a moralist libertarians, and like the, the comment would be, and like what? And so like people are using drugs and it's like bad for their health and in a way bad, bad for society. They will say, and what's the problem here? I don't see problem. And if you are on the other side, if you're a utilitarian uh, libertarian, you will find this example where even if uh, freedom restricted, you can find these examples of like uh, unwanted, uh, social not effects unwanted effects so 
<laughs> in a way I made my comment. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it goes back to one of those central central tenants where it's about your you can do anything you want as long as it doesn't impact others. So the idea that you would decriminalize drug use doesn't mean that you could legalize people selling it because it's still a, uh, a, a like a business that takes advantage of people. So it's I guess it goes back yeah to one of those central tenets of a lot of libertarians. Not so much the very radical side of things, but who believe that you can do as anything as long as it doesn't harm other people. But that's depending on what level of the scale you're at, <laughs> you know, what people say is free choice and what isn't. I also read before, not sure it was so much Rothbard, I think Rothbard uses the example of during the Industrial Revolution when there was no uh, state health insurance that companies actually set up health insurance for their workers. Yeah. But there's a lot of theories that because we have the state and we have these institutions, people don't have individual, don't think of their individual responsibility to society. They're like, oh, they'll take it. Yeah. The one thing I read before was that moving into a libertarian society is like moving out of your parents' house for the first time and you're actually responsible for yourself. <laughs> so, great comparison. <laughs> yeah, you know, because a lot of people think, oh, but the state will take care of it. I don't have to do this. But when you're put under pressure to actually be responsible for other people, I think we're seeing that a lot now, especially with the younger generations coming up. We're seeing a lot of activism that's not based on like, oh, think of me and my future. It's they're really thinking about the world as a, a whole outside of state institutions. So. All right. That was a really nice discussion, you guys. Um, at this point, I mean, I don't want to, you know, um, cut it off right here necessarily, but unfortunately, I um, and I believe Vanessa also have to go because we have got, uh, we've got our next meeting uh, coming up. Um, I could, if you guys wanted to, um, just leave the room open for a while, and the um, recording will just end there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So yeah, again, thank you very much, Nikolai, for your uh, presentation. It was very enlightening. And, you know, the discussion afterwards really cleared a couple of things up for me for, you know, regarding your research design. So I'll be looking forward to seeing uh, possibly more of that in the S SRC later. Okay. Right. And also